Well, welcome, uh, leadership community. Uh, we are in a series called Creating a Disciple-Making Culture, and today we come to step five, which is celebrating disciple-making values. Last uh, month, we looked at uh, speaking a common language. That's one of the things that really helps you to create cultures when everybody's on the same page, pulling in the same direction, saying the same kinds of things, whether they're using axioms or defining key terms. We want to speak a common language. Now today we're going to add to that uh, celebrating disciple-making values. And uh, there, there are two ways you do that. First of all, through the victories that you celebrate. In other words, the things that you kind of lift up in your culture because they're important to you. And uh, secondly, through the questions that we ask. Uh, are also very telling and revealing in terms of what's important to us. So let's let's begin with the victories that we celebrate. Now, when you you, you think of trying to create a disciple-making culture, uh, you think, okay, well, what are the values of a disciple-making culture? I mean, what is it that makes a disciple-making culture? What is important, and what is it that we want to you know keep focused on so that we can actually make progress and celebrate them? Let me give you just a handful. Uh, you know, first of all, disciple making. In other words, in, in lots of churches, uh, things like attendance or, uh, you know, buildings or cash, sometimes called the ABCs, attendance, buildings, cash, uh, become the priorities. They become the values that we celebrate. Um, sometimes it can be something even as subtle as decisions. You know, we've all probably been around churches where you've seen this, uh, where every Sunday you're being asked to make a decision, even though everybody in the congregation has made a decision. In other words, what's happened is the starting point has become the finish line. And, 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 and we keep kind of losing sight of the real mission, which is to make disciples, and we're all about making decisions. So we want to be constantly focusing, emphasizing, and I think we've done a good job in that direction over the last few years of kind of getting people focused on disciple-making, uh, not any of the other things that can throw us off. Uh, secondly, it might be disciples making other disciples. Um, that's what a disciple really is, according to Jesus. Jesus said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. In other words, if you follow me, I'm going to make you into someone who can make other disciples. So that's a helpful definition that helps us know, yes, I am a disciple because I can see myself in the process of, of, of learning that. Um, Obedience-based discipleship could be a third one. And, and by that, we mean obedience-based discipleship as opposed to information-based uh, discipleship. Jesus didn't say... Uh, you know, go make disciples teaching them. He said, teach them to obey. There's a big difference between teaching them to obey and teaching them. Um, here's a fourth one. What I would call a God-centered spirituality. And I'm, I'm basing this on the great uh, commandment where Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God and to love others. And, and yet the dilemma of our own kind of Christianized culture is what? It's very narcissistic. It's very self focus. So we, you know, we tend to fall into that me-centered spirituality. God wants to get us into a, a, a God-centered, other-centered spirituality uh, that would uh, be more missional, for instance. And, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can kind of see this in a lot of different ways. Um, here's a fifth one. Uh, a, a biblical uh, grounding in Scripture, to be biblically grounded as opposed to, let's say, being experientially grounded, where everybody just talks about their own experience. No, you want to say, what is this, you know, what does Scripture say? And, you know, Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So um, uh, what we're doing in our small groups, what we're doing in our services, what we're doing in all our ministries is trying to get people to be biblically grounded, uh, to get them to be relational. Here comes another one. Six uh, is uh, relational in our disciple making, as opposed to, you know, a kind of a mass production, classroom oriented uh, programmatic approach to discipleship where people go through a series of curriculums or, or uh, uh, you know, classrooms and they say, oh, I've, I've been discipled. I, I went through that. Well, the disciple is a lifetime thing. Now, if you think of all those things, you know, being, being relational, where, where Paul said, I, I gave you not only the gospel, that's the curriculum, but my own life. So, to be relational, to be biblically grounded, God-centered spirituality, obedience-based discipleship, disciples making other disciples. You know, these are all 
values you see that help to create that kind of culture. Now, that's, the, that's kind of the what we value. Now let's get practical and talk about, okay, how do we do that? Well, let me give you some ideas. Um, because the way we celebrate it could be summed up in this little axiom. What we elevate, we perpetuate. What we, what we lift up, you see, for others, um, gets baked in to our culture. Uh, so we want to give careful thought to the things that we say, you know, you know, when we're leading, whether it's up front in a small group or ever, because those are the things that, you know, very subtly communicate importance, and, and this is what's important around here. So let me give you one example, a recent example. At the uh, annual meeting, Mark asked me to give a quick report on uh, uh, our progress in disciple and our year of discipleship here with the uh, integrated series. And uh, so I, you know, I, I, I use those values to think, okay, which ones have I seen some progress in that we could elevate so it gets perpetuated? And uh, the first thing that came to mind was I just had lunch with Joel, and uh, Joel had told me this story about uh, how they're using a, a curriculum called Multiply by Francis Chan. And it's all about disciples learning to make other disciples. And Joel and Sophia are, you know, uh, discipling some kids so that by the time they get out of high school, uh, they will have then multiplied by getting a couple other kids in their groups uh, and, and gone through the same discipleship curriculum with them, hopefully with the idea that they then too would become multipliers, not just, you know, additions to an existing group. Um, actually, Joel gave that example, but I went ahead and, and emphasized it again. Why? Because that's the way you create culture. You know, you keep emphasizing things so much that people go, oh, 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 and I was able to kind of build and say some things uh, in addition to what Joel had said, but to really lift up that value. Disciples, are people that are making other disciples. Now, here's a, uh, here would be another one. I, 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 got, I had gotten an email of someone who said, you know, they'd always been a little bit afraid that they didn't know the Bible well enough. But th then they said in the next phrase, but um, th then I realized that that was my problem. I was waiting until I had the Bible, you know, mastered, and, and there were all these things that I already knew that I wasn't acting on. And so I started acting on what I knew, and, and, and he said, that's really made all the difference. Now, that was a beautiful testimony, you see, of uh, obedience-based discipleship as opposed to information-based discipleship. And he was actually sending that out, that same email, uh, to all the people in his small group. So I thought, okay, that's great. Those are exactly the kinds of things that we want to celebrate. Let me ask you, okay, how do you do that, okay, in your context? Uh, you might not be able to get up in front of the congregation and give those kinds of examples, but when you're in your small group, um, you could do certain things like in your covenanting exercise. You think, okay, what are the things that we want to say are important? And so as you covenant, you say, you know, one of the things that's really important to us is transparency. You know, I've been in a lot of groups where just, you know, it's kind of superficial sharing. So by actually stating it, by bringing it out and building it into the covenant to say, we want to be a transparent group where it's safe to have problems, to have failures, and, and that's okay. Uh, you know, that's one way you kind of say, hey, this is important, but here's an even better way. It's by what you model. And so you should share with maybe somebody else that, you know, maybe an assistant, uh, you know, apprentice or somebody in your group to say, hey, work with me on this during this year. Let's you and I take the lead uh, in being transparent. So we're going to share our failures. We're going to share our mess ups uh, with everybody else so that they start to feel comfortable to say, you know what, it's okay. Remember, speed of the leader, speed of the team. So that's the way you elevate transparency. You see, by talking about it up front in terms of covenanting, in terms of um, you know, taking the lead and actually being transparent yourself in your sharing. Um, uh, another way would simply be uh, uh, prayer. Oftentimes, you've noticed in what happens in small groups, prayer gets sort of relegated as a kind of an afterthought. And so it ends up at the end of the meeting. You know, you got five, ten minutes. And so you say, hey, well, somebody close this in prayer. Now, what is that communicating? Well, it's, prayer's not really that important. One of the things I love about the Discovery uh, Bible method is that it repositions prayer up at the on the front end of the of the meeting so after you get done sharing you know you you, you have a chance to immediately pray while these needs and celebrations are you know uppermost in your mind 
Um, so those are some of the things, but I want you to all think about this and the best way to, you know, assimilate this in your life is to actually, um, you know, as you hear some of these ideas, spend this next month trying, trying to experiment with them and, and, and work them into your life. Um, I, I, I would encourage you to do this. First of all, identify the values and, you know, write them down, then record when you see people actually doing it. That's what we do around here. Um, I guess we can't look at it, but if you were to look over on the window right there, you would see uh, a list of uh, values and examples that uh, we and a couple other staff, when we get together, we kind of brainstorm and come up with some, so that, so that we don't forget them, uh, because some of them are pretty subtle. But So first of all, you want to identify them, probably put them on a list. Uh, secondly, record uh, evidences or examples or illustrations. And then thirdly, celebrate them at appropriate times. Now, that's... Uh, that, that's celebrating the victories. That's one way of creating culture um, and, and reinforcing the things that we really value. Now, here's another one, and that is by the questions that we ask. Um, uh, let, let, let's think for a second about the, you know, the, the, the kinds of questions that we ask here. Here's a community-building question, and you'll all recognize it. Uh, it goes by a different name. My favorite is Roses and Thorns. In other words, what are the roses that are blooming in your life this week? And what are the thorns that made you say, ouch? And uh, uh, sometimes it's called highlights and lowlights or, uh, you know, what was good about last week and what caused stress in your life last week. You can ask it a, a bunch of different ways. But if you're doing it right, um, it, it's going to breed some transparency. It's going to breed some community people are going to in fact we spent the first half hour of our hour and a half basically going through that and, and, and talking about it and then praying about it and uh, uh, it really does build community uh, but there are other things for instance obedience if obedience-based discipleship is one of our values how do you do that well you remember in the uh, in the in the discovery bible method that we're using there's a question that's being asked and i i i'm encouraged because one of the areas that i see is when uh when our teaching team is preaching they will sometimes even say that in their language at the end of a message they'll say you know you know think about what you need to apply or to obey uh, so in other words they're lifting up that value now the way you can do it uh is uh, and, and here here's where you see it when the you know, when your kid's kingdom teacher asks a question um, uh, or, you know, teaches her class and then the kids go out and say, the, the parent asks them, what did you learn in kid's kingdom today? What, what, what are they subtly underscoring? Information-based discipleship. Then it's all about what you learned, okay, cognitively. But if you ask the question this way, uh, Johnny, what are you going to obey from the message that kids kingdom today what, what, what are you going to apply uh, that you learned from the Bible uh, now that's beginning to move towards an obedience kind of uh, based discipleship that's an obedience building question uh, another one uh, if we if we want to create people who are God centered and discipleship centered in their spirituality as opposed to self-centered asking the question how can I love and serve the people in my world my spouse my kids people I'm going to have appointments with today, the projects I'm working on, how do I love and serve them? When I asked that question, I began to notice that it began to shift uh, some sensitivities in my own life where I began to do little things that I hadn't, hadn't been doing before because I wanted to build that sense of other-centeredness more strongly in my life. Now, uh, and now, how do we do that? I mean, I'll give you some examples of those questions, but um, the, the critical point here is that you have to repeat it until it becomes a habit. Um, and when you do, when it becomes a ritual in your life and you're doing it all the time, now you know you are being formed into the very image of Christ. Um, maybe I should say one final word, just a pastoral issue, because I noticed that a lot of our groups have trouble with this. And uh, sometimes as I've probed, I've found that there's an there's a issue beneath the surface. In fact, one of our staff members, when I was leading a, a discussion with our staff team, they, they said, you know, I, I feel like I'm bragging if I talk about my obedience or what I applied in my group. And of course, that's, a, that, you know, that's, that's something to take seriously. It's a human tendency we all have. In fact, Jesus talks about it when he says, you know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You know, do your, you know, your deeds in secret that your father might 
see you and reward you. Now, that's part of it, but there's a tension in the Sermon on the Mount where in the same chapters, uh, you have let your light shine before men, that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Now think about that tension. On the one hand, there are times when you want to keep your mouth shut, and they're probably the times when you're dying to tell somebody what you did, okay? And there are other times when you need to lead and where, where you need to encourage people to show them that you take seriously uh, obedience to Christ and, and actually applying the things that you're talking about. Well, I trust these th thoughts will be helpful to you, and uh, I would encourage you, you know, over the next 30 days before our next installment, uh, that you, you know, try to try to implement some of these ideas so that we can become, at New Community Church, a disciple-making culture.